Thanks, everybody. I don't know if I'll have the best speaking voice, but now I'll talk in a super radio voice the whole time, <laughs> just in case. Um, thanks to Stephen. Thanks to everybody. Um, this has been really fun already for me. I'm really honored to be here and to be a part of uh, Monktoberfest. But um, I will promise you two things, and it's not the radio voice thing. Uh, first thing is, I will talk about something completely different than everybody else. <laughs> completely different. And this is going to be the worst PowerPoint you've ever seen. I promise you those two things. So, enjoy. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, influence and curation. I know those are like super buzzy buzzwords, but uh, I think they actually have some meaning today on the social web. That's where I primarily come from, um, in addition to my experience in the music industry. And uh, now that's what I do full time for the Cincinnati Enquirer. But I'm going to jump back a little bit. I, I just, as I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to talk about, for this, after Stephen asked me, I had a lot of ideas. I wanted to talk about the music industry and how they've screwed up so many things, um, you know, and, and how they screwed up how piracy kind of came about. We just were speaking about that a little bit and how they threw a lawsuit at everything that walked um, and how it really stunted the growth of um, entrepreneurship in the industry. But I, that just seemed a little boring. Um, and. We can talk about that later, and I hope this doesn't just fade out. Like I said, what did I tell you about the PowerPoint? What did I tell you? Um, I just decided instead, though, I wanted to kind of tell my story first and kind of how I got to where I am right now. So anyway, 10 years ago, 10 or so years ago, um, I was a huge music fan, just like Stephen was describing. I listened to this radio station called 97X out of Oxford, Ohio. And it was really how I found all my new music. I was a super dork about it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, really, I was addicted. Um, has anyone ever heard of 97X besides Steven? 97X. If, if you haven't, we got one guy from Ohio. That's right. Excellent. So 97X claim to fame for a long time was from the movie Rain Man. If you've ever seen that movie, Dustin Hoffman is in the car and he hears a radio station say, 97X, bam, the future of rock and roll. And he says it like 18 times over and over again. 97X, bam. 97X, bam. And he says it over and over again. And all of a sudden, people were wondering, I, I don't care about that. People were wondering, what is this radio station? What's, what is it all about? Um, and those of us that knew it knew how special it was. I was going to play the YouTube clip. No input. All right. I told you. There's Dustin Hoffman. I don't think I'm going to be able to play it. But there he is. That's what he was saying in the car. So anyway, <laughs> around that time, I was really interested in, in, obviously, the station and what it was all about, which was basically people curating playlists for me and to me, even though they didn't know it was for me and to me. People that I uh, listened to and had a personal connection to and trusted them over time. They were curating those playlists for me and changing my musical palette over time. And all I wanted to do was be a part of it and be in the industry. So the closest thing that I could do back in 2002, 2003, was to start a blog. Um, now, of course, as many of you remember, this is still the time when people would look at you and say, why do you start a blog? Why do you want to tell people what you had for breakfast? Which is how they respond to social media about five years later. And some still do. Um, I started a blog called Each Note Secure, and um, it was uh, really, really horrible at first. I uh, was trying to explain to my friends and family, because they're the only ones that read it, um, why The Strokes and Elliot Smith were the second coming of musical bands they may have actually heard of. Um, and I ranted and I raved, and I got most of my ideas from 97X. Um, but uh, the main thing about it was is that I was having fun, and before long, People were coming to me and asking me, hey, uh, have you heard of this band? Or hey, there's this show in town that I actually read what you wrote. It made an impact on me. You influenced me in some way. I, I totally geeked out on that. I thought it was impossible that that could happen. Uh, after all, I, I knew what my web numbers were, and they were not very good. Um, not many people were coming to the site. 
Uh, but there were a, a, was a small amount of people that really appreciated what I was doing. So during this time, I'm covering my favorite radio station still. I'm having a lot of fun. And then it dies. Uh, it had gone off the terrestrial grid and turned to internet only for a few years. They had a model where they were trying to get subscriptions. And back in 2005, uh, you know, Spotify and RDO and those things weren't around. And so people weren't willing to plunk down money to stream music. Um, and it died unceremoniously, but I cried. I'm serious, man. I was, I was, Stephen remembers. <laughs> I was so upset. Uh, so I, um, you know, wrote about it and uh, lamented the loss of the major influencer and major curator of music in my young life. And I got to know a couple of the DJs there through that time. They knew I had a blog. Uh, they invited me in for some of their lounge act sessions, which were live sessions. Musicians came in and played, uh, which was, you know, amazing to me. It was like going to the Taj Mahal in a little bit of way, even though it was a little crappy radio station. Um, but not long after, uh, all of a sudden, someone got on their message board and said to their fans, hey, I want to bring this station back. And he just happened to be a billionaire, um, which helped quite a bit. Uh, his name was Bill Wynn, and he founded a music service called Lala.com, which you may or may not remember. Apple bought it a few years ago, and now Bill works in Cupertino uh, for that team. But at that time, he was just on the internet on a message board, and he just was like, hey, people tell me that Woxie's the best. Should I bring it back? And of course, the super fans went super fan and uh, said, yes, please, please, please do. So it came back. I was overjoyed. Um, a couple months in, I went to visit and see the guys again, and they got off the air and they looked at me like someone had just punched them in the gut. They're like, we're pulling nine hour shifts and we're loving being back, but we cannot keep doing this. So I said, you know what, um, what can I do? Can I help? <laughs> Is there anything I could do? Uh, so the program director said, well, yeah, can you review a few CDs for us? I was like, this is the best thing ever. Of course I'll review some CDs for you. I mean, I get to have, I mean, really? Like, this sounds amazing. Um, at the time, I was unemployed. I'd been laid off from my job, and uh, my wife wasn't uh, too big of a fan of me reviewing some CDs for free <laughs> when I should be out looking for work um, that actually paid the bills. I have three kids as well, and uh, some mouths to feed. So um, I went home and I told her, I said, hey, they said I can review some CDs. She goes, all right, just find a job and do that at the same time. That's fine. <laughs> um, I went back and wrote a manifesto, basically, to this billionaire guy, this Bill Wynn. I said, here, look, here's the thing. You need help. I'm not the best thing that you can get, but I'm something that you can get. So here's why you should hire me, and you, know, you need to be doing this and this on the web that you're not doing. You need extra people on the air. You need more people uh, jumping into social media, which was brand spanking new to a lot of us at the time. And he ignored it and never sent a response. And I went into the station. I talked to the program director. I said, hey, I copied you on this. Do you, what do you think? Do you think he liked it? And he said, the, the guy said, I think it's great, but I, I'm not calling the shots. We're hiring somebody tomorrow. Um, to be our third DJ, and she's been in the industry for a long time. It's gonna be what we need, uh, so I appreciate it, but you know, how are those CD reviews going, basically? Um, and I said, all right, I, I appreciate it. I was crushed, I understood though, they had to do what they had to do. So the next day, um, literally the next day, the guy calls me and he says, hey Joe, um, here's the thing, uh, the woman that was supposed to take the job here, she bailed on us last second and we've got nobody, and I can't keep doing this, so here's what I'll offer you. 20 hours a week for an amount of money that was less than I was getting on unemployment at the time. <laughs> and it's temporary, because in three months, we're moving the station out of here because the guy that just bought us wants to move us out of town. So imagine my emotions, super fan, dream job, worst financial possibility. <laughs> You know, my wife breathing down my neck, as she should be. Um, and so I just went to her, and I was like, look, please let me do this. Like, it's a foot in the door. Like, the influence I've gotten from this station and from these guys, to be a part of it would just be a dream come true. The guy at the station, I went to him, I said, can you at least get me what I'm making on unemployment? 
And he said, let me find out. I mean, it was like 200 bucks more, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. So anyway, I got the job. I did it for three months. They didn't end up moving. I wrote another manifesto or two, ended up becoming a full-time DJ, getting a four-hour air shift a day, started a blog, uh, started us on Facebook and Twitter and got us rolling. And for four years, I was able to become a curator. I was able to take the position of someone that was doling out those, that music. And just like when I started my blog, I sucked at it at first. I got on the air those first couple nights and I probably said, oh, 5,000 times. But you know what? I learned so much. They were willing to take a shot on me and said, hey, we know you know about the music, even if you don't know how to be on the radio. We can teach you that. <laughs> so I say all that to say that dreams end too. <laughs> As Stephen mentioned at the very end of that, we moved to Austin, Texas. So they went from them giving me uh, part-time Austin, all right. Um, I love Austin. Um, I miss it. Um, went from uh, them telling me, hey, you know, we'll give you a three-month gig for, uh, for peanuts to we want to move you and your family to Austin as a part of this big deal because we'd been purchased again. And so we moved, bought a house, set everything up, and nine months later, the plug was pulled. Uh, startup cultures are like that. We were always a startup culture even though we weren't I mean, we were a 25-year-old startup, right? So uh, plug was pulled. I was on the air and was told by someone during a break, hey, this is your last air shift. And we kind of had an idea some stuff was happening, things were coming, but it was not like, hey, this is going to be the day, right? So I went home and I sulked and I got upset, obviously. Um, I felt like this, you know, I always said during it, I have to be happy and thankful for the time I got to do this thing that I wanted to do but it's done, it's over. And there just aren't jobs like that. I mean, there are radio stations and there are good music gigs around that deal with the type of stuff that I was into, but it just didn't match up. And even in Austin, which is an awesome music city, uh, I couldn't find anything. So I went back to my roots in Cincinnati. I realized that the stuff that I had learned at Waxy uh, through social media and everything was really akin to marketing and really akin to uh, how the social web was just exploding. And my buddy said, you know what, I think, you're, I think you're a social media manager. And I was like, no, I'm not. I was like, I use it, I do it. I mean, I had a Twitter only request hour. So I would be like on the air, I'd say, all right, Twitter only request for this hour. I loved it. Um, and I managed it from a top down. It wasn't just me talking. Anyway, I somehow conned myself into another job. <laughs> I feel like I con myself into these jobs. I don't feel deserving of them. Um, I always tell my buddy, like, someone's going to tap me on the shoulder one day and say, all right, we figured it out. <laughs> You're good. Kudos, but pack up. The Cincinnati Enquirer has been around for 170 years. Um, social media has not. And so when I applied for that job, I had a couple of connections through my music blog. They used to syndicate my news feed. And um, basically I said, hey, you know, here's the deal. Here's what I've been doing. Here's why I think it's important. Here's what I think the future is. Because at the total dork that I am, uh, I stare at my screen eight to 10 hours a day. And I don't do real work like you guys. Like I just look at social stuff so, and read articles. Um, so I don't work nearly as hard as most of you. but. Um, I talked them into it and uh, have been managing their social channels ever since. So I don't say all this to position myself as some kind of employment miracle or superhero in any way. Um, I say it all because I really deeply feel that um, curation and human curation and influence is something that is available to anyone. Let's see if we can get this back going now. Um, because the web is... Uh, what it is. I like this quote uh, from Mitchell Kapoor, getting information off the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. And uh, Twitter is even worse. Like I have people come up to me all the time and say, hey, I really think I should be using Twitter and doing it, but like it's just, there's too much noise. I don't get it. Like I know why I'm on Facebook. I want to see my buddy's, uh, you know, bachelor party pictures or my, uh, you know, my, my buddy's kids' uh, birthday shots and be, catch up with people from high school. But I don't understand Twitter. I just don't get it. If I'm going to do anything, I'm just going to read it. And that's fine. 
Um, but I, I think what Twitter and Facebook and so many of these social channels have done is they've given us an opportunity to be influencers. Anyone can do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And I tell you this now because I've decided most recently that I'd like to be an influencer when it comes to craft beer. Um, and the reason is just because I love it. I, I really do. I love uh, the aspects of it here. I love it in general. A buddy of mine and myself started EmptyGrowler.com, and um, we're not super serious about it. We don't have crazy tasting notes, but we love craft beer, and we want to tell people about it, and we want to, at some point, become influencers in that realm as well. And it, it's kind of started already. I have people ask me about beer all the time now. I don't know nearly as much as a lot of you probably even know about craft beer, but I know what I like, I know what it tastes like, I know how to recommend it and be an influencer in that space. Um, so my wife is pretty adverse to most of this and told me I was crazy for doing uh, most of what I do and still does. Uh, but earlier this year, we decided we wanted to uh, do a vegetarian diet for a couple of months. And so my natural incl inclination is, well, why don't you start a blog about it? Why don't you do this? You know, and she's like, I don't know, that's, uh, that's, that's not my thing. I said, J just get it started, just do it on Tumblr, it'll be fun, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. If you don't like it, don't do it. So she starts posting recipes and photos, and it's really good. Like, she's a great photographer and a great cook. I just, like, set the Tumblr up, you know. Um, and I'm like, hey, formatting needs to be this way. Yeah. So uh, before you know it, I got a letter in the mail, um, actually it was a magazine article, and they come to me and said, hey, would you like to advertise your website in here a few times? Um, so last week, I got a note from them and said, hey, uh, we heard you're associated with this, uh, this blog called Eat More Veg. Is that true? Would they like to advertise in this magazine? I'm like, that's my wife, man. That's <laughs> of course, I also come home now and I see her um, standing on top of a chair with a camera over a plate of food, going like this, and looking back at the light, and, and, you know, and I'm like, what are you doing? It's not even dinner time. She goes, this is just a staging plate <laughs> for the blog. <laughs> um, so she is, uh, she's into it. This is a great quote that I heard uh, re relative to the web from Paul Adams, who does uh, global brand design at Facebook. Our brains have been hardwired for 10,000 years to socially interact with others. The web hasn't suddenly changed this. Because of this, our closest friends' photos from last night will always be more important to us than brands. Kind of is simple in a way. It's, you're like, well, yeah, of course. But here's the thing. The web is dominated by brands at this point. Um, they're everywhere. And we are sharing things about brands that we would never have shared before. Um, you know, think about 20 years ago calling your friend up on the phone and saying, hey, Steve, uh, had this amazing Tropicana orange juice last night. No pulp, but good. <laughs> right? You're not good. No. Uh, I got to go. But she'll share that on Facebook like it's going out of style. You know? And brands love this. So they want to be your buddy. And they get in. And they want to uh, tell you why the, the version with the pulp is just as good as the no pulp. Um, and uh, it's crazy to me to think how dominant they've become. But... People are more influential than brands. People have a voice on the web. Anybody can have a voice about almost anything. One of the things I was doing in between um, these, these jobs, uh, a buddy of mine and myself about five years ago started a blog network. So what we wanted to do was we're like, hey, we're bloggers. This is kind of fun. How can we give other people that platform? People that are like, I'm talking to my friend and he wants to know uh, about music, and then he starts telling me about motorcycles, because I don't know anything about motorcycles. And I think to myself, man, that'd be a great blog. You should do that. If you do the right things, we can help you get the right audience. So basically, we subdomained a bunch of topics that we found through SEO, and we decided, hey, a lot of people are searching for these topics. Let's find people to write blogs about this stuff, right? Um, so we set them up. We paid them per post. It was pennies. Um, and we took the ad revenue from it. It was a failed, half-baked idea. We had a lot of fun doing it, made a few bucks here and there. But the point of it was, is that we gave people a voice that they didn't think they could get on their own. 
We gave people the opportunity to write about the things that were in their head, that were driving their spouses crazy, that their coworkers would rather not hear about anymore, and spread it out and gave them that platform on the web. Uh, one of those people um, is a friend of mine, and she was a politics blogger. But I noticed that all she was writing about on her blog was coupons. And I said, you know, I know you like politics, but I've noticed that you're kind of taking like, hey, it's Coupon Tuesdays on your politics blog. Maybe we should, maybe you should just start a couponing blog. She said, I've been thinking about that. I really have. And so we started a couponing blog for her. Uh, about three months later, her traffic was our highest traffic blog by a long shot. Uh, the couponing craze was beginning as we've, you know, seen and probably still see. Uh, and the local TV affiliate uh, hired her away from me. <laughs> I was like, look, I know I'm paying you 75 bucks a month. Um, I don't know how they can compete with that. But uh, if they want to try, I will let them try. So what's the future of um, curation and um, being an influencer. Well, to me, it's these three things. Uh, to me, the future is that human curation has to be a big thing. If you want to hear me rant and rave later, ask me about Pandora. Um, I'm not a fan of Pandora. I think it serves a great purpose and it serves a lot of people, but the lack of human curation that is involved with it is incredibly disheartening to me. Um, it'll get two songs right on for me, and then the third one I'll say, where the hell did that come from? Has anyone ever had that happen on Pandora? Even if you love it, I'm not trying to make you take sides. Um, and it's just the way that it is. There, there aren't humans curating it. Now, Pandora will tell you otherwise. They'll say, well, it's all the human listens that have led to the algorithm that pushes out what we uh, send you when you decide to uh, turn on that John Mayer playlist or whatever, you know. Um, I think that a better example of human curation on the web right now is turntable.fm. It's a great site where you can go in and be a DJ and you're these little cartoon characters. Um, it is incredibly addictive for a while. The first few weeks I was on there, I was like emailing people and being like, all right, we're gonna be in this room at nine o'clock and it's gonna be you know, all 90s electro pop. And it's just, I mean, and like 20 people would show up and we'd just hang out for four hours because it was my buddy playing the song for me and we were giving him like votes up and down on the other end to let him know how we felt about it. What's great about Turntable is that if people think your song is shitty, they'll just like tick it down and it'll skip it. Try it out if you haven't, it's great. Um, I think the future is also, well, it's also the present, honestly, is uh, visual organization. We talked about the fire hydrant and how just insane it is to try to get information off the web. Uh, Pinterest has it right when it comes to visual organization. There's a reason why their traffic has continued to like double and triple and triple again. Um, because visually, it's incredibly appealing. It looks nice and it's incredibly shareable. Um, I think there's some organizational elements in other areas like multimedia that really need that kind of Pinterest um, example. So, you know, I think that um, in multimedia we should or hopefully we'll see a Pinterest type site that uh, allows you to do lists of your favorite songs for a certain thing, uh, is a little more video heavy and friendly, but is still visually strong because people on the web are incredibly fickle, right? I hate to say it, people don't want to read words on the internet. Doesn't that sound horrible? It's, it's partially true though. I mean, you know, especially when you're just browsing after a few beers, you're on the web and you're in your Facebook feed and you're looking at this, uh, oh, there's a picture. It just works. I mean, I, I hate to, that's a sad comment maybe on uh, how we are as a society, but, but visual stuff is huge. And finally, engagement and trust. Um, one of the things that I do at the Inquirer right now for our journalists is really try to give them the tools where they can engage with the people they're writing for. I say to them constantly, look, you want more people to read what you wrote, right? <laughs> it's as simple as that. I don't care if you're 65 and you think Twitter is the devil. It will get you more eyes on your story. That's hard for a lot of people to grasp, especially in that industry where for years all they had to do was send the tablets down from the mountain to the masses and then turn around and, and walk away and, and do new ones. Uh, so they have to engage. We have to engage. People that engage build trust. People that get that trust become influencers. 
They become curators. You have so many choices right now on the web as to where you want to get your information about anything. Music, beer, movies, whatever. Who are you going to choose and why? Well, for me, it's the people I've had some sort of interaction with, some sort of engaging conversation, even if it's just a tweet or even if it's like this. I was on Untapped earlier this year, and um, I was drinking a Bengali Tiger, and Six Point Brewery is very active on Untapped. If you've ever checked into one of their beers, they're very likely to give you a thumbs up or to comment, and they'd done that a couple of times, so, you know, how's the Bengali taste? And so I was getting a little uh, cheeky, and I said, it tastes great, Six Point Social Media person. As someone who is a social media person myself, I know that's probably your job to go out and do that. Little did I know, I was talking to the president of the company. The president of Six Point, Shane Welch, gets on untapped and does this himself. Not all the time, probably, but a lot. That, to me, is engagement. That, to me, builds trust. That, to me, makes me want to pick up some Six Point over something else some other time. Maybe it doesn't for you. Maybe it's all about price. Maybe you're just a bud man. Um, but regardless, <laughs> not here. Not, not, there's nothing wrong with that USA. Um, anyway, that's the kind of stuff I think that is going to continue to rise and be really what we decide influences us. Really, it's going to be how we decide who we let curate things to us, not just in the stuff I'm talking about today, but in anything. Um, that's all I got. I, I do want to say, um, check out EmptyGrowler.com, EachNoteSecure.com. Uh, and let's be friends on Untapped because I know we're all checking into beers and stuff. So let's, let's, let's do that.